Okay, good morning, everyone. Hope you're enjoying. Uh, the first speaker of today here is Mihailo Popescu, who is uh, Chief Research Officer at Kudo. Uh, and Kudo does something very interesting. Uh, so Kudo has developed a groundbreaking solution that leverages research uh, sourced zero-party data to identify and expert relevant audiences to use their own social media. This talk is going to be about bridging insight and digital activation. So since we're late. Okay. Cool. So how many of you here in the audience have um, a cupboard full of uh, candies, chocolate at home? Okay, quite a few. Where I come from, about 60% of people have you know, a secret stash where they have their guilty pleasures hidden away. Imagine one, if one day you reached out to your you know, stash with your candies and there was nothing left. And then you said, okay, fine. Well, I'm just going to pop to a corner shop to, to get some more. And guess what? The shelves were empty. And this happened to everybody in the country. It would be a, a nationwide crisis. Something like this is actually happening to marketeers. The third party cookies are going away. In 2004, all the major browsers will, will discontinue them. So the marketeers are essentially going to have an empty jar. They will have to go and figure out how they find the audiences and engage with them. This is where we stepped in. We built the first precision activation engine and we are setting ourselves and building systems to help marketeers actually tackle that crisis. So we built the first precision activation engine and today Journeys is going to be centered around what it is and what it means and what it can do and what it actually does. So thank you very much for coming this early. My name is Mihailo Popescu uh, and I'm from a company called Qdo, which is a nickname for Questionardo. I'm a marketing scientist by profession and this is similar to a data scientist. I'm helping companies to understand consumer complexity. I'm using research, first and foremost, to generate the data, and then data to get answers to those difficult questions. By and large, I essentially measure and model latent phenomena, like decision-making, what drives someone's loyalty, what drives purchase, and also what deters someone from purchasing or using certain products and services. I was a former university professor. I lectured in Belgrade. I uh, lectured uh, at three different universities in the UK, in France as well. But then I came over to the dark side and I joined Cambridge Analytica as a head of research six months before it collapsed. But I met some amazing people and uh, we sat together and uh, we founded this company called Qdo and we raised uh, close to seven million US dollars so far. I mentioned that I'm a marketing scientist. What is actually marketing? What marketeers do? That field is massive and has unclear boundaries. So marketing is a little bit of everything. I studied marketing for my undergraduate studies, my master's studies, and my PhD. And I would struggle to answer some questions about marketing. I would struggle defining marketing. But if I have to oversimplify, marketeers are essentially helping companies meet demand. Okay, and their work would boil down to this process that is described with this STP acronym, which stands for segmentation, targeting, and positioning. This would apply across the board unless you have a company that has undifferentiated offer, which means a company that is looking at the market as one homogenous blob. Okay, but you know most of the companies they are engaging in differentiated marketing, which means you would segment the consumers in different groups. You would select which groups you would like to cater to, and then you tailor your offering, your communication, so that you yield a proper response from that consumer group. But how is, segment how is this first process done, the segmentation? Well, most marketeers would use a rule of thumb. They would do a guesswork. They would assume, they would make an educated guess what different segments exist in the market. And believe it or not, in most of the cases, this would boil down just to like simple demographics, like men, women, young, old, employed, unemployed, students, et cetera, et cetera. Some would use reports. 
they would go and engage with companies like Ipsos, Nielsen, and they would they would commission a piece of research, and then those traditional research agency would deliver a report, and then you would read this nice nice document, and you would see what different segments exist. And finally, uh, those best and the brightest and the most capable would use data. But let's have a closer look what happens in digital marketing as a, as a subset of, of, of the broad scope of marketing. Again, we have segmentation, targeting, and positioning, but these are essentially the challenges in digital marketing. First of all, in many cases, there is no data or data at hand is poor or inadequate. There is a lot of regulation, which means, well, the data that you have, you can't access. There is not the right consent. You would approach this group of consumers, but they never gave you this permission to do so. Sometimes it happens in big organizations that you have data silos and that one department would not talk to other department or would not be aware that some other data exists that you can use to cross-pollinate the sources. And finally, you have, you have companies that, that sit you know, on, on the vast amounts of data, but they don't have the right skills to extract the proper insights. When it comes to targeting, let's say, let's say you have everything to do segmentation, but once you get to targeting, which means identifying people that you would like to speak to and finding the right channel, very often it happens that the data that you have has nothing about the channels. When I say channels, I, I'm talking about media. I'm talking about social media, traditional media, TV station, radio stations, newspaper, where those people are, where, they, where, where are their eyeballs, where is their attention. So you don't know where to find them. And sometimes when you have personal information, using too much of personal information is creeping out people. Um, according to Gartner, if you start engaging with your consumers and demonstrate that you know more than two or three pieces of personal information, it will put them off. Okay? It will not create a sense that you know, you, you are friends and that you know, you know something about your c customer, it creates a sense that you are intruding on their privacy. And this is putting people off. And finally, as I said, cookies are going away. So marketing is, will, will have to go out and figure how they, how they overcome this challenge. And finally, if you are able to, ta to target and you come to a positioning, which means you want to occupy certain, certain mental space in, in the minds of your consumers, and when I say positioning, maybe you want to position your brand as a, as a premium brand, or maybe you want to position your product as a budget product or value for money, whatever you want to do. Sometimes the data will not tell you what to offer, how to say this, and what to say. Okay, so challenge through the entire process. But the biggest challenge out there is how you cross this first gap, okay? If you have no data or no consent, well, you have to improvise. You're essentially gambling. If there is inadequate data, the segments are not actionable. You can resort to using uh, data management platforms if you are rich. Most companies are not. And finally, as I said, cookies will be things of the past very soon. So how did we solve this problem? We are essentially, we built an innovative SaaS platform that is bridging this gap between seg uh, segmentation and targeting. We use research with segmentation and activation at the core. So we would commission a large, large-scale survey. We would collect zero-party data. This is the data that is willingly given to us with the right permission, contains no personal information, okay? And then we would use advanced segmentation techniques to find different groups of consumers. Uh, interestingly, we're using adversarial clustering algorithms. We have seven different families, and these algorithms are competing against each other until we yield the number one solution that is statistically sound, solution that is enabling us digital reach, and finally, a solution that makes sense to marketeers. Sometimes solutions that have great statistical properties, when you start looking at the personas, makes no sense. So we have to find the right balance, because marketeers have to know how to engage with these people. So the persona has to make sense. You know, the, the, the new hotshot in the town is ChatGPT, large language models. We're leveraging those to, for insight interpretation. You know, when you segment the data, when you, got, when you get the customers, it is, in traditional way, it is a very tedious and uh, labor-intensive process where a research expert has to sit down and look the vast number of cross tabulations, clusters against all the features that you have in your database to build a compelling narrative about the segments. 
So we would sit down and write these personas and thinking about how we name them with, with chat GPT, you can essentially feed the outputs of your high square test directly into, into, the, into the algorithm. And then chat GPT would, number one, write up the persona and number two, name the persona. Okay. Ultimately, the task of our data science team in our company is to retire research team, remove human from the process, let expert just oversee what the machine does. And so far we had great results. Then once, this, once, once we decided, once the personas are written up, the algorithms are then isolating what are the targeting criteria that uh, marketeers can use. Now this is an interesting part. One thing is a questionnaire. We design a questionnaire with segmentation and targeting in mind, but all of our questions are mapped against targeting criteria on Facebook and Google and now TikTok. What does it mean? If you are answering one question about what are your hobbies, I learn from that what I can use to target you. So for example, sometimes you saying that you are into, let's say, uh, hiking. Okay, I immediately know that, for example, you like mountains, you like outdoor activities. So that one answer leads me to three or four different targeting criteria. Okay. So we can learn a lot without actually having to ask you for any personal information. And then once we build it all and once the algorithms find what are the unique targeting criteria for each and every segment, we enable our users one click effortless, effortless export to social media. This means that the platform that gave you insights now enables you to progress to action. One click, you have uploaded these audiences to your social media and you are ready to precisely engage with the audiences that you identify in research to be relevant for your brand. And all of this is also following robust data protection and GDPR compliance because you as our users, you are getting access to aggregated insights, number one. And second, when you are exporting the audiences, you are exporting no data. You are exporting recipes for targeting. And we, we as, as I said, we collect no personal information. So everybody in the chain has a peace of mind and it's a win-win strategy. Respondents who are getting incentivized and share no personal information, us who handle no personal information, and our users who, who, who at the end receive no data. Okay. So everybody is happy in the chain. If this sounds interesting, you can scan this barcode and it will take you to our uh, uh, landing page where you will be able to see uh, the demo. There is a video. You can also sign up for beta. Uh, beta is absolutely free. You can you know, get on board and start playing with our data and see how it works. Let me give you a case study. Um, this was a case study for a bank in Serbia. Uh, this is a major, for one of the major European banks also present here in Zagreb and the region as well. Um, they approached us saying that they've been in the market with an online cash loan for the past two years and they've seen some attrition and they would like to experiment with QD and see whether they can make any uplift. It was obviously a, a challenging task because we were facing potentially shallow market. Maybe they depleted the demand. We didn't know. So what we said, okay, we're going to commission a piece of research for you, we're going to do segmentation, follow the process that I described, and then we compared how our campaign compared to their campaign called Benchmark. And if you can see here, in terms of marketing performance, we, we outperformed or almost every single parameter a marketer is looking at. For example, we had five times, more, we drove five times more traffic to their website, and the, click per, the cost per click was 70% less. So more traffic at less cost. Sounds good. But the marketeers, they want conversion. This is what we, what we managed to do. In their campaign, they managed to convert one out of four loan applicants, which means one out of four applicants were approved alone. In our case, this was close to uh, three out of four. So 72% of applicants, of, of, of audiences that we draw to, to their website have undergone the 30 minutes application process and then 72% were approved. So this is three times better performance. Uh, across, across the board, in principle, we've seen uh, an uplift of, th of three to four times in terms of conversion. We had instances where conversion went up by 1,000%. But that's embarrassing. If I, if I showed you here, like, well, you know, I did this and, you know, my performance is 1,000 times higher, like, no one would believe me. So we like to say that we are doing, like, three to four times better compared to an average campaign. Okay. But let me talk about journey, how we got to the point where we are today. I mean, 
I'm, I'm a marketing scientist and my mindset is agency mindset. I like to have a client, I like to, to design a research for them, run bespoke piece of research, produce a report and so on. But Kudo is a product. Okay, you are now building a sauce. It requires a completely different mindset. And I, I never danced this game before in my life. I don't know what it takes. Neither did my co-founder as you. But we set ourselves on this journey because we knew there is a demand and we can do something great. Our initial idea was to create a platform that is automating questionnaire design. Okay. Why? Because questionnaire design is one of the most demanding tasks that you have in the research process. It will impact the quality of your data. You, 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 there's so many details, like the number of questions, the, the, the language that you're using, you know, um, ensuring that people don't um, cheat, that people don't drop out in the survey process. It, 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 I, I don't want to go into details. It's, it's, it's a, a lecture of its own. And this was a bottleneck in any research. When you get the brief, it takes time to engage with the literature, design this, test the new questionnaire, make sure it works as, as intended, and then you go to the field. So, but building a machine that is designing a questionnaire is a deep tech challenge. And at the time where we excited our investors to give us money for this, we got a significantly smaller ticket that we intended. We, got, we just got $1 million. And then we started thinking, well, what can we do with $1 million hiring people in London? And then we decided to build precision activation engine. So the, the, the part that comes further down the chain and say, well, well, let's build precision activation engine, see how that works. If we are successful, then we can go and get more money. So that was a strategic pivot that, you know, I hated it in the beginning. Like, you know, I'm here, I did this startup, I want to build like, you know, questionnaire design tool, but then we started doing precision activation engine. And then the problem was, what is the MVP, minimal viable product? You know, we struggled. We, you know, our, our initial idea was very grand and very detailed, and you know, it took us much more time, much longer than, than we expected. So instead of launching in March 2022, we launched in March 2023. We now have two products. We have Qdo 3D, which is a SaaS. You pay your subscription, you get onto the platform, and platform gives you insights in most recent segmentation in seven different industries in UK and USA. These are financial services, food and beverage, fashion and beauty, travel and tourism, home and garden, entertainment, well-being, technology and communication. Currently, if you go to our website and if you sign uh, on beta program, you will only see financial services UK and USA. The rest we are adding and they will be up and running on the platform um, by close of play September this year. And then we have Qdo 4D. We have so many clients coming to us select like, I need something bespoke. I need something specifically for my brand and my industry and my country. We can do that anywhere in the world. We can operate in 150 countries because what we are doing, we are, we are getting our respondents from panel aggregators. So panel aggregators are ass essentially assembling all, all available panels of respondents in a particular country. So for example, in the UK, we work with 400 different panels at one go. This means I can collect a robust sample of 4,000 people in the UK within 48 hours, representative by age, gender, and region. Okay, so I don't have to hire people to go and personally speak to someone because this is another source of bias. We have technology that is enabling us to like draw robust samples very quickly. So Qdo 4D, as I say, it's a mix of SaaS and service, okay, or SaaS and agency, where the client would give a specific brief we would do a manual bit on designing the questionnaire and collecting the data, and everything else then is being delivered through Qdo 3D, and once the client sees the results, they can also progress to activation. Okay. And we're currently validating product market fit. We are trying to see whether there is a demand in the market for, for us and whether what we are promising is being delivered. And as I said, we are currently using large language models for segment persona report generation, which is significantly offloading the work that, that we have to do, that we would have to do otherwise if ChatGPT didn't come into town, okay? And now here is an interesting moment. Where are we heading? So you remember at the beginning we said our, in, the initial idea was to create a machine that is generating questionnaires? Well, actually, that, that machine is there. There is ChatGPT. Of course, ChatGPT cannot think like an expert, but it can, it can do a good, good chunk of uh, heavy lifting for us. So we are embra embracing this paradigm shift. We're hypothesizing that ChatGPT will change the way how people interact with software and what people expect from software. 
So we believe that it's already happening. Users will expect wisdom at their fingertips. You would type a request to a software and software will start, start giving you uh, insights and, and, and wisdom. So we believe that learning how to use the software will be a thing of the past. So what we're currently building is chat to segments, the chat to data feature. Chat to segment means we're feeding all the background information about certain segment and then you are able to query the data using natural language. You don't have to go through the spreadsheets, you don't have to use dashboards. The system will start telling you in a natural way what this segment is like, you know, uh, who they are, what's their profile, and so on and so on. And you can specifically query certain things. And then another thing, because we started first with financial services, and we realized that our potential clients want something else. So for example, we had a case with a major fashion brand saying to us, what do you know about runners? And I said, well, actually, I have just a data set about financial services in the UK. Uh, I can conduct a, a piece of research for you. They said, like, no, we need, we need insight right now. And I said, okay, let, let me see in my data set, what do, do I have runners? And I realized, oh, there are 600 people who are running, and I profile this group. And then I realized, why don't we open the doors wide for everybody? Anybody could come and start typing any request. And imagine system behaving like this. You come to our platform and you say, hey, Kudo, what do you know about runners? And Kudo would say, like, well, actually, actually, I don't have a study specifically designed for runners and sports, but I have financial services uh, uh, study, and I have a you know, substantial subset of people who are running. Would you like me to profile them? And you say yes. So runner profiling is then a byproduct of running study. So why not? So this is what we are doing right now, building this leveraging uh, large language models. We also want to exploit large language models for creative ideation, because this is the point for target, for um, positioning. You know, once, once you understand who is your customer, you also need to understand what to say and how to say it. This is where large language models can also step, step in. We're also pursuing uh, channel agnostic targeting. We are going to keep adding digital channels so that you can target people across the board. And finally, we're coming to the big price, and this is automated survey generation. We would like to automate the entire process back to back, and as I said, the idea is to retire researchers. I would like to step back and not have to design questionnaires, not have to uh, you know, write reports. I would like large language models to, to work as instructed. Okay. And finally, the biggest pain is transi transitioning from startup to scale up, okay. making sure that we have enough traction, that we are generating enough uh, recurring revenue so that we become you know, interesting to uh, venture capital funds. So what are the lessons that, that we personally learn here? Well, you know, in any startups, you will have loads of obstacles, and many of the, those obstacles you will not be able to foresee from the front. So you have to be flexible. You have to adapt, pivot, or leap forward. You have to be ready to change your plans. Okay. As you know, it requires patience and persistence. You need to keep pushing. You know, great ideas, they take time to flourish. You need grit, dedication, hard work, and what is more, you need resources. Market shifts happen. To us, the biggest market shift that happened was, of course, the emergence of ChatGPT. We could be scared, saying like, oh, well, we're done. Well, actually, no, we're going to, to surf on that tide. You know, We can leverage the, that technology to come much faster that, to that grand vision that we had in, the, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in mind. And finally, em em embrace the race. You know? Someone else out there is having exactly or very similar idea to yours. Trust me. People are, you know, people are seeing opportunities the same way you are seeing them. And we are all in a race. So making sure that you are faster than the others uh, can have a significant impact on, on, your, on your success. Also accept failure, you know. I'm, I'm in this company, and this company might disappear in 12 months. Maybe the cash will run out. Maybe there will not be traction. Accept the fact that in, in 12 months this all might be gone. But enjoy this ride. Okay, because there is, it's, a, it's a great learning opportunity and, you know, you're in this game no matter what. So, any questions? Yes? Uh, I work in a food trailer company where the clients are vegetables. Okay. So I'm just questioning segmentation. Segmentation, uh, why is this important? So, there I saw we need to segment, do segmentation to to be able to target a group with the uh, advertisement. Okay. But in order, is it always necessary to make segmentation? Can you do, can I not do 
marketing, personalized marketing. So why do you need to make groups? Because you have 10 groups, then it automatically reduces to that uh, uh, sex, uh, age. Okay. So can you explain it? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, sure. Um, let me tell you a personal anecdote here. I was a university professor and I had a lesson about Cambridge Analytica. I was teaching consumer research. And back then Cambridge Analytica was claiming to be able to target people on individual level. And I was just thinking like, how is that possible? You know, what am I missing? Is, is there something that I, you know, is there something that I don't know? And one day when I came back home from a lecture, I saw an advertisement for head of research at Cambridge Analytica. So oh, I'm going to apply. At least I'm going to see those people and, and speak to them. Later on, I joined the company and I realized target, targeting people on individual level is impossible. Okay, it's impossible. There is no, essentially there is, back then there was no technology for that. And as I said, even if you do that, and even if you start leveraging personal information about that person to make it personal, you will creep people out. So we, we have evidence for that. Second thing is, the reason why we're doing segmentation, first of all, is not, not just to target people. You want to learn about them. Marketing is all about learning what customer need and want and what are their pay, pain points. Okay. The idea is not to brainwash them. The idea is to better serve, to, to propose a value. So that's a constant learning loop. This tool is not, is not only for targeting. It's first and the foremost insight platform. You keep learning. Every three months, we're updating our insights. So, the marketeers are able to understand what are the shifts in the market, what are the emerging trends, what is you know fading out, and so on. So I guess the point here is targeting people in this way will have better performance for marketeers because you will have an educated approach how you are addressing the market. Yeah, that, that's that, that's the ultimate idea. that do you also do, if you design a questionnaire, then you look uh, how the design is, so yes. how the, the, the box disappears, yes. how they disappear, yes. so all this, uh, how many people work on it, so the so we have designers, yeah. uh, front end design. Uh, we are using third party survey hosting platform, okay. uh, but currently the way how we design questionnaires apart from uh, let's, let, let, let me tell you how my life changed since ChatGPT emerged. Previously, when I'm designing a questionnaire, I would look at the scientific literature. I would see what theories are explaining that particular domain of consumption. Let's say consumer loyalty. For example, there is a, there is a framework called uh, loyalty ladder. And then they would explain different group of users and what is driving their loyalty, what is preventing their loyalty. And I would leverage those those frameworks and theories to, to inform my questionnaire design. Of course, I would have to do desk research to understand in that particular market, what is driving consumption, what is driving loyalty, who are the competitors, and so on and so on. And then I would manually design the questionnaire um, in, let's say, Google Docs, and then I would transfer this to um, a platform like Qualtrics or, or, or Alchemir. You know, you, you are then scripting. But how my life changed, this is how it happens. A client gives me a brief, I upload this brief to ChatGPT and say, ChatGPT, tell me which theories are relevant for this, for this marketing problem. And then ChatGPT spits out 10, 10 theories. Oh, okay, I know what's the game here now. ChatGPT, using this and this theory, design a question that will, co that will cover theme A, theme B, theme C, theme D. Puff, it spits out the questionnaire. And I say, okay, I'm an expert here. This is fine, and then I, I adjust this questionnaire. So previously from a month, I'm now designing questionnaires in two or three days, okay? This is how it made my life different. So there is three people, we'll soon be four, who are doing this, this, this thing. Yeah. And this is a case of bespoke studies. We have our industry-specific research, which is we design questionnaire once, and then we don't have to review it for at least a year. So like this questionnaire is just being renewed every three months. The survey is being deployed over and over again. And the data set augmented. So ultimately, the, the, the segmentation that you see on our platform is containing the last 12 months of data, which is 16,000 respondents per industry per country. Yes. So uh, 
uh, you said you are using panels in UK and yes. in the US. Yes. Um, do you think that they represent uh, audience, online audience in those countries? Yep. So if I use one panel, I would be... So first of all, let's explain what, are panel, what panels are for, for those of you who, may, who might not know. Panels are directories of people who voluntarily opted to receive surveys and they're being incentivized, they're being paid to do so. If you're using one panel at a time, that's a problem because you will inherit the bias of drafting people into the panel. Maybe some people are, maybe some panel companies are recruiting people from Twitter only. Some will go to supermarkets, some will put advertisements in newspapers. But if you are pooling respondents from 400 different panels at once, what happens is that these biases are slowly being wiped out. You will never get the sample that is fully represented of the structure of the people by age, gender, social class, and so on. But you will get something that is fairly there. And what you do then, once you got your sample and once you cleanse the data, you then apply weights. We do something called rake weighting, where I weight simultaneously by age, gender, region, social class. So this weighted sample is then represented, representative of the structure that I want. I also argue one thing, that in life three times, you, three things you can't escape, okay? You can't escape taxes, death, and bias in research. So I always expect there will be bias in research. I'm not saying like, oh, this is perfect, but the thing is, is it useful? And we are showing in, in practices that, that like segments built through this approach is useful because you see an uplift in your marketing. Cheers. Yeah, if a client of yours has uh, the data about your customers and uh, an IT system with reports, how do you integrate? Is this a big issue to uh, send the data to the client to be interpreted in their IT system? So is it we, we don't share the data with the client. I mean, what do you say? Uh, what is the... Uh, if you're, if a bank, a financial institute, institute okay. is your client, yes. what do you give for, for them? Insights and the recipes how to target segments. They don't get data from us. They don't get any no, reports? No, they get insights in terms of dashboards. We okay. don't produce, we don't produce like physical. Phys I mean, if you don't send them data, you show only on your platform. Yes, they okay. log into the platform, they see the charts, and if they want to target, they have integration with their social media, and then our platform exports the recipe for targeting. Oh, yes. Set of targeting criteria per segment. This is, this is very exciting and insightful. Thank you. We don't have any time left, so we can continue chatting over coffee. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, guys. It's a great pleasure.